No one is going to help you out of the goodness of their heart. So just be prepared for that. You have to really earn respect. It's time for Backstage Chats with Women in Music, where the stories and voices of female music makers inspire women like you to be dreamers, to be rule breakers, and to unleash your inner rock star. Podcasting from Austin, Texas, the live music capital of the world, here's your host, Thea Wood. Welcome to another episode of Backstage Chats with Women in Music. I'm your host, Thea Wood. And today's guest is a woman who I describe as having a knack for creating her own opportunity. With a Whitney Houston-inspired vocal and a Taylor Swift guitar style, this country pop songwriter is as eclectic as it gets from the tip of her backward baseball cap to the toe of her rhinestone cowboy boots. Please welcome to the show, Kendall Conrad. You know me so well. I'm impressed. Well, you know, it just came out. It just came out, Kendall. And you know what? And here we are. It's kind of like a party day because it's Cinco de Mayo. It is. It is. Do you like Mexican food? Oh my gosh. I live in Austin, Texas. This is like, this is a national holiday down here. That's amazing. (laughs) I've never been to Texas. Oh, well, we would welcome you with open arms. Hopefully, um, I would love to get down there soon. Okay. Well, as soon as all this pandemic craziness is out, we'll have to make that happen. Heck yeah. Let's do it. Let's do it. And also, because of Cinco de Mayo, in honor of that, in the spirit of our conversation, I decided to dress appropriately, and I slipped on my old gringo cowboy boots. Did you really? I did. Because I know you're a cowboy boot cowgirl. I am. I love them so much. They're such a, uh, they're comfortable, but they're fashionable too. Like, it's like a two for one. Yes. And a lot of mine, like my corral boots, they're in all different, like, like lizard skin and different patterns. And like you said, like I have rhinestones and sequins and there's all different kinds. So I, I love them. I can tell. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that later on too. But I figured we should probably get the party started with the shakedown. Are you ready to shake it down? Hit me. All right, let's get started. Our first question, who was your first concert? Hillary Duff. Hillary Duff. I'm surprised. Where are you? I kind of am. I thought it would be a country a country singer. Well, I was going to say when I was younger, I was into not even just pop music. Like I was into the Backstreet Boys, NSYNC, Hillary Duff, Britney Spears, like the teeny bopper kind of pop music. And then my mom had a friend that we used to hang out with all the time and her kids, and they loved country. And so we would listen to Shania Twain and Garth Brooks and the Dixie Chicks. So I was actually introduced to country much later than when I actually started listening to music in general. So that came after my first concert of Hilary Duff. Isn't that amazing? But it makes sense now because now that I know the background, having that country pop twist and sound to your music totally makes sense. Yeah. And I mean, I still, it's funny because I still draw from you know, like those old Britney Spears songs that she first came out with where they have like three different melodies stacked at once. Like I do that in Leader of the Pack. So I still use some of those things that I listened to when I was a kid. Next question on the shakedown. What was the first album you bought with your own money? I had to really think about this one. And I want to say it was Taylor Swift's debut album. It must have been high school. I must have been 17. Yeah, I was older. So every year for my birthday, my mom would buy me CDs. So I never really had to buy CDs myself. Fun fact, she would get me like all the CDs that year that I had like 10 CDs I would get for my birthday because that's what I wanted. I want to listen to music. So when that album came out, I remember just being like, mom, every, like everyone's talking about this girl. She's from Pennsylvania. Everyone's telling me that I have to listen to this, this CD. So I'm pretty sure it was that one. I went out and, and bought it because I wanted to see what all of the hullabaloo was about. Right. Well, it turned out to be quite a big hullabaloo, didn't it? <laughs> yeah. She wound up inspiring me to be a songwriter. That's amazing. Yeah, it's funny. Which artist or band is in heavy rotation on your playlist right now? You know, I don't like listen top to bottom to whole albums a whole lot. But like right now, I just love Ariana Grande. And I saw that she's putting a new song out with Justin Bieber, which I'm excited about. And then I've just been listening to Sam Hunt's new album. I think it's called Southside. 
yeah. And then like, I'll listen to like one off random, like indie songs that my friend Megan sends me. Which woman has had the most influence on your career? I'm going to throw you for a loop on this one and, and say my mom. Your mom. We always get moms. This is really? good. Really? Yes. Just because she, she not only inspires me, but she really pushes me. She pushes me to work harder and to get out of my comfort zone. And when I feel very down on the business in general, she's very uplifting. So I, I think I owe a lot of my success to my mom. And she does do a little bit of writing with you, doesn't she? Yeah. So ironically, the first two singles that I put out, she co-wrote with me. If you could have dinner with any woman dead or alive, who would it be? So I feel lame, but if I'm answering honestly, it would be my mom. (laughs) Oh, that's so sweet. Yeah. I mean, I would choose to eat dinner with her over any woman ever. Like I just, she's my favorite person. If it's not my mom and I have to actually answer this question, it would probably be Oprah. Just because I think the way her mind works, I would love to talk to her. Yes. Well, maybe we could get your mom and Oprah to have dinner with you and everybody together. You should come. You should come with us. Okay, I will. <laughs> <laughs> Just send me the invitation. I'm I on will. It. I'm on it. I will make time no matter what. What is one life goal you'd like to accomplish before climbing that golden stairway to heaven? I want to go out on a huge headlining stadium tour. Got it. Absolutely. That would be fabulous. Do you have a particular stadium you'd want to start in? You know, just the the classics, like the Wells Fargo Center here in in Philadelphia. If I was really huge, I would do Lincoln Financial Field, Madison Square Garden, you know, the usuals. The usuals. Yeah, I dig it. It's a great goal to work toward. And like I said, we're putting it out in the universe. Well, we're going to talk a little bit more about stadiums here in a second as well. But for now, let's tell the audience, we'll be right back with more from Kendall Conrad after this message. We would like to thank Labyrinth Incorporated for supporting Horizon Music Foundation. Labyrinth specializes in charity state registrations for thousands of charities nationwide and has earned an A-plus rating from the Better Business Bureau. For more information, visit labyrinthinc.com. We'd like to thank our Shoppers Club partner for supporting Horizon Music Foundation and the Backstage Chats with Women in Music podcast. Shoppers Club preferred members have access to over 500 eco-friendly health, household, and beauty products delivered straight to their door. More information is available at greenrushaustin.com. Again, that is greenrushaustin.com. Now, back to the show. And we're back with Kendall Conrad. And I'm so excited to talk with you because you're getting ready to release an EP. And as of today, Cinco de Mayo, you have released two songs from that EP, with the first being Leader of the Pack and the second one being Come to Your Senses. And this was all recorded in Reba McIntyre's studio. Is that right? So when I, I think it was when I graduated college, I did an EP that I never actually, like, I put out, I think, one song on it. But that one was recorded at Reba Studio. This one was recorded, it was still recorded in Nashville, but this one was with Matt McVaney. And he did some of the early Kane Brown stuff. He's worked with Lauren Elena. So I did do that, but not for this current music. For this current music, it was with uh, Mike McVaney. Yeah. And how did you two hook up? Um, You know, I don't really remember how exactly it happened. Nashville is cool in that if you kind of sit down there and are in that town, you meet so many people and you're connected to so many people. So I don't remember who actually formed that connection for me, but it was someone who told me about someone who told me about someone who then was like, oh, you should work with Matt McVaney. And I was like, okay, cool. I'll check him out. And we wound up doing this whole five song EP together. So that was pretty cool. Nashville makes me laugh because I call it the town of, but I'm really, because I'll be talking to uh, my cab driver and they'll say, well, yeah, I'm driving a cab, but I'm really a songwriter. (laughs) Or I'll be talking to the bartender and the bartender says, yeah, yeah, I'm a bartender, but I'm really a guitar player. And so I always feel like there's all these connections that are constantly happening no matter where I go. Yeah, I can attest to that. That's so true. I've been in Ubers and the person driving is like, 
oh, you know, my son makes music and I kind of blow him off because like everyone makes music. You know, he drops me off and I'm like, you know, tell your son good luck. And he's like, oh, yeah, I don't think he needs it. He signed to Curb Records. His name's like, and he names this huge artist signed to Curb. And I'm like, oh, okay. Your son just had a top 10 last week. Congratulations. <laughs> um, so Nashville is, it's very weird down there. It's fun though. It is. It's a cool community. And obviously, as you know, there are a lot of networking opportunities going on. And with these two songs that you had worked on, I have to say that I got a different kind of feel from you as a country pop artist than I do a lot of other people, which is for Leader of the Pack and Come to Your Senses, I get this feeling like you're kind of daring people to do something. Like, I dare you to throw me to the wolves uh, Mm -hmm. in a kind of a defiant way. But then it's like, oh, and I dare you to come up and flirt with me, which is kind of more in an invitational way. Oh, Um, interesting. Was there kind of that vibe? I'm kind of curious as to what your mindset was in, in choosing these two songs first. So out of the five, I think Come to Your Senses was the closest to what's on country radio right now sonically. Right. I just thought it's safe and it's a good first song to put out for people who haven't heard of me or heard my music to like get to know me. Leader is my favorite of the five, but I didn't want to scare people, if that makes any (laughs) sense. Honestly, I think it's a really strong message. I loved it. I wasn't scared. I felt kind of empowered. I am so glad. I am so happy that you say that because I feel the same way. It's been my, my personal anthem. But I just thought for the average country music fan, you know, who's listening to Blake Shelton and Keith Urban and Luke Bryan, and and I just thought Come to Your Senses was more in line with that. It's familiar. It would Mm -hmm. be more familiar to them. And they'd be more likely to give something a little more outside the box a listen or a chance, if that makes any sense. So that's why I put Senses out first. And then when I put out Leader, I felt comfortable with the reaction that I got from Come to Your Senses. And I was like, okay, I think they're ready to hear this one. Right. That's interesting, that I dare you attitude. That's cool. I haven't gotten that before. That's awesome. That's what I got. And you know, hey, maybe it's just me and my personal baggage. (laughs) No, but you're right. Now that you say it, I'm like, wow, you just, you told me something about myself. Well, there you go. Well, maybe you're flexing your muscles here. I know, this is fascinating. Reflexive muscle. All right. So we're also going to listen to a little sound clip here of Leader of the Pack so everybody gets an idea of what I'm talking about and how I'm feeling about it. You dumped me in the dark out in the woods. You thought you could keep me from the stars. They're closing in now. I can hear them growl. You left me for dead with nothing else to be said. Didn't give me a second thought. Set your traps, and then I was caught. And if I'm away to the top, no, I ain't gonna stop. I'm still a she up and spit you out. No one around to save you now. And you threw me to the wolves. I'm coming home. I'm coming home. had brought up people like Blake Shelton. And you have a very interesting history of creating your own opportunity, which I find very, not just inspiring, but motivating. Because the first thing I think of is the first YouTube video that I saw popped up on your channel 
was you singing after you entered the 2009 Pottsville P18 Idol competition. And you sang My Man by Barbara Streisand. Mm -hmm. Yep. (laughs) Right? That's creating opportunity. You put yourself out in front of people in a competition. And how old were you at the time? God, that was, I think that was before I even taught myself guitar. I must have been 16. And you also created opportunity for yourself in the Keith Urban performance. You did a duet on stage with him, We Were Us. And I wanted to find out how did that happen? Because there's a story behind that. Yeah. So I had already followed him on social media because I'm a fan. And it popped up in my news feed that he was looking for girls to sing this Miranda Lambert duet with him because there was no, I guess there was no women on the tour to pop in and sing that song with him. So it was like, upload a video to YouTube and like email it to us. So I sent in this video and I didn't think, I didn't thought nothing, you know, I enter these things all the time and I never even get picked as a finalist. So I was like, there's no way that I'm getting picked for this. And sent in the video, heard nothing. And then it was literally like two days before the show that his management called me and was like, hi, we'd like you to sing with Keith. Wow. Yeah, it was crazy. So how did you prepare with 48 hours to go? So I don't even remember. It's all such a blur because it was like, it felt like a dream. So I did nothing to prepare other than plan what I was going to wear, listen to the song a billion times. And then sound check was the day of at the venue. And yeah, and then I sang with him. It was pretty cool. I would assume that that in and of itself created other opportunities for you. Yeah. I mean, I got so much even local love because I got to sing with him like in my home state, my home area. And that boosted even like my local paying gigs. People wanted me to play even on a smaller scale. And then on a bigger scale, I wound up getting to play songs for his personal publishing company in Nashville. Boom. Nothing ever came of it. But I got the opportunity for them to hear my songs, which was really cool. And another opportunity that makes me smile that I feel you've created for yourself is you've become kind of a little bit of a national anthem queen. (laughs) Yeah, I don't even know how that happened because the anthem scares me in general. What a great way to get out in front of thousands of people who have never heard you before. Yeah, I mean, that was the whole idea. And then especially this year, because I, I put out Leader in October, at the same time, the sports team or the arena will play leader because it's such a, it's a great sports anthem. They've been playing the song during the games. So it's just, I get to sing the anthem and then hear my song at like the Wells Fargo Center. So it's been kind of crazy. Now that's just too cool. In concert, you typically do not have a band with you. You play solo, right? I do. And how does that work? How do you make that logistically happen? So for local gigs, I'm solo acoustic anyway. But like for when I open for Blake or the bigger shows, I have tracks to my original songs. So I can like play acoustic guitar or I have a six string banjo um, and I'll play over top of my track. So you get live music and I'm singing over like I get to feel my super heavy bass that I want to I want in my my live shows because you really can't get that pop kind of R&B vibe from like a very simple live band, if that makes any sense. Right. Like I could get a drummer and a bass guitarist and a lead guitar and all of that, but it's not going to sound the way that I want it to. And I put on those tracks and it's like, boom, I have my synths. I have my big bass. I have it all. And I can just play banjo over it and I have my sound. And so that's it's kind of what I've been doing. And I like it. I don't know about everyone else, but that's, it's the way that I want to sound. Well, and I have to tell you from, you know, a practical business point of view, it's also much more budget friendly. It is. Yeah. Unless, you know, the the venue or the event is like, you know, we really don't want pre-recorded music. We really want live. It's important for us to book live music, which I totally get. And then in the same breath, you have like that huge, huge music festival in the UK and Kanye West karaoke basically over his own songs. It was him on stage. <laughs> no band singing to his tracks. And he didn't even like, he rapped over his songs and left. Oh, well, there you go. Remember that? And everyone complained about it, which was kind of funny. They were like, yo, we paid hundreds of dollars to see him play live. 
like karaoke. So it's interesting. But then I argue, would they have been as satisfied if he had a band and it didn't sound like his record? Sometimes I have to see somebody live before I can determine if their music or their singing or the whole feeling resonates with me or not. I've had bands that I've loved on the radio, but then live, I was like, eh, they're not doing anything for me. And then I've had the opposite where, you know, I didn't really enjoy them so much on the radio. But then when I saw them live, I was like, oh, this is what all of the, you know, hoopla is about. This is cool. Yeah. I feel like entertaining is a huge part of success with music. You can have a great radio smash. And then, like you said, you can go out to see them. And it's like, wow, they're kind of a dud. First of all, I think to go out almost every single time on stage by yourself takes uh, great bravery and ability to say, okay, let's just get in the zone and do this. But from other interviews and things that you've said in the past, it sounds like on stage you have kind of one feel and then off stage you're more of an introvert. Yeah. So it's funny. Like, I don't even know how to explain it myself. It's just, it's like, it's me on stage and it's not me. It's like who I would like to be. And I think fans tend to think that performers want to be the life of the party when they go somewhere or are very comfortable in the spotlight. And it sounds like you're saying, okay, everybody just do their thing and I'm okay here, you know, just watching or, or seeing what's going on. Yeah. And it's, it's like, I would rather be performing at a party. Like I'll show up and set up my equipment and like, I'll entertain you. So maybe that's, that's what it is. It's I find great joy in entertaining people. And when people are really, they're dancing or they're crying over a song or they're really getting into it or you know, someone comes up to me and they're like, I can really relate to that. Or I was having a rough week in this show. It was great. I enjoyed listening to you. And for me, that's what it's always been about. It hasn't been about being the center of attention necessarily. It's just, I love to sing and I love to entertain people. And then when it's, I'm off stage and I'm not singing, I'm not entertaining, I'm not really sure what to do with myself kind of thing. And so I kind of just stand in the corner and observe. But I've also gotten some great song ideas from standing in the corner and observing and just hanging back. So it's interesting. So that kind of leads up to my next question, which is, would you rather go to a club or watch a horror movie? Oh, horror movie. This is an understatement. I am not a great dancer, so I, I would probably avoid <laughs> I'd avoid the club. But yeah, I, I love horror. Horror is the bomb. It's the best. Actually, I want to bring up Norman's Lullaby. You watched that? Of course I did. I loved it. Oh, thank you. Okay, if folks, should I tell the audience first of all, just this is available on YouTube, it is. Norman's Lullaby by Kendall Conrad, and she sings it. Are you in your living room? I am. Yep. Okay. And was this for the Bates Motel series? Yeah, so this was before the very last season, and I think it's on Netflix. And again, my mom and I watched every episode pretty much together, and it was the like third or fourth season, and the actress who plays the mother, Vera Farmiga, she like plays piano and sings throughout the series. And we were just like, yo, what if we wrote an original song and, and tried to get it to, uh, I think it was A&E, it was the network that was carrying it at the time. And we're like, what if we pitched it? We got her to sing it on the show. And so we, we wrote this song together, my mom and I. We put it up on YouTube. And one of the executive producers of the show tweeted it, saw it, was like, awesome. I think Vera liked the tweet. They all saw it, but we couldn't get them to actually use it, which sucked. But they all saw it. But they all saw it. Did you say that they already wrapped up their series? Is it yeah, already over? it is. Ah. So we wound up, I know. But they all saw it and we were just like, God, I wish we could have gotten it in there. But I, I'm i not super familiar with sync or with placements or uh, song pitching to TV shows in general. So I'm not sure like what kind of red tape we're dealing with. I'm not sure if they needed a demo because it was a YouTube video. So I'm not really sure if we went about it the right way, but it was a fun project for us. And it was cool that they actually heard it. Absolutely. And uh, honest to God, I think that if if it's not one of the other three songs that are going to be released on your EP, I would love to hear a professional recording of that come out if you're ever looking for extra music. Really? Yes. I thought it had 
you know, your love of that horror, it had kind of that beautiful melancholy sweetness, but there's a little tinge of craziness maybe in there. I love that. I feel like you know me. And I thought it was very emotional. It was very emotional for me. I really Thank liked it. You. So just throwing it out there. <laughs> We've never met before prior to this. We're going out for a cocktail at some point, right? <laughs> this is insane. Yeah. You like know me so well. I just feel like the music and the videos and the and your message. And I love how you have this bright, like I said, opportunistic, very go get them attitude, but there's a little bit of a dark underbelly under there. There is, there is. The daring and the defiance. And Thank you for noticing. I say roll with it. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm going to have to revisit that song now. Oh, good. Yay. Because I think country music can use a little bit more of that, that kind of message from its female performers and singers and songwriters, because, yeah. you know, sometimes I think we get kind of put into that little box of sweet and smiley and sexy and happy and, you know, except for the, you know, the heartbreak songs. But I think that, you know, there's plenty of room in the industry for some of that darkness. Yeah, I agree. We can always dig deeper or wider or in a different direction. I don't know if you knew this, but in December of 2018, for the first time since Billboard had tracked, started tracking playlists, I think the country music top 20 did not have one female artist on it. Yeah, I remember reading that. I was appalled. Isn't that unbelievable? And I say probably hundreds of thousands of women all over the world who make country music, there's not one that's worthy of the top 20. Right. That's just sad. Not one. It is sad. It makes me angry. And the thing is, is that that's part of the reason why we started the show is because of the research into those kind of numbers and saying, well, what are one of the ways that we can lift up women? And one of the ways is to share their stories and tell people, hey, their music's out here. A lot of who we talk to are rising stars and, you know, this is what they're doing. This is their music. Buy a ticket, buy their music, buy merchandise. <laughs> Get out there, get them rolling on Spotify because there are gatekeepers out there in, in a lot of places that are not. And I don't think that it's really intentional as much as it's just systemic and that women aren't getting played like the men do. And this is our way of trying to help balance that out. So I really do appreciate that you're here talking with us and about this and how you feel about it because spreading awareness is how we make change. Yeah. And I feel like when. I'm not even sure who posts these kind of things. When people post articles like with stats of it getting better, it also pisses me off because it's not getting better and you're not helping by posting that saying, oh, Marin Morris went number one, yay women. And I'm like, that's the first woman to go number one in like, what, a year? Right. That's not something to be proud of. It blows my mind. I don't know. I get, I get so riled up about this because it, it feels like the country music radio market is just saying like women aren't worthy and our songs aren't worthy of airplay. And it's just not true. No, it's not. And I hear so much, I mean, a lot coming out now from women in different directions. I thought Brandy Carlisle was such a breath of fresh air, non-formulaic. She's got her own thing going on. And I hope that moving forward, more stations, more Programming directors, whoever the powers that be are, celebrate that and start embracing that more because that's how we grow in our industry. I mean, you know, there was a concern. There's been concern that country music listenership has gone down. And maybe it's because 50% of the population isn't being represented. Whereas in pop music, they are more represented. And country, I feel like, says that it's very family-based. And that's a nice very homey thought. But at the same time, if you're not in the family, they kind of don't give you the time of day. You have to find a way to get into the family, which for me was very frustrating. Right. Well, and I think too, that part of it is you've got these conglomerates that are putting together playlists that are based on maybe what Spotify is doing or what YouTube or whoever somebody is pushing from somewhere. But remember when every single station had local DJs who were saying, let's listen to this new artist. And mm -hmm. we don't have really people curating like that anymore based on their personal likes 
and what they think is going to be big. It's more about this machine. Right. And they're not allowed. They're like legally not allowed. It's so sad. So when you come out with your EP, what's the first strategy to getting that played? So with the EP, I've almost rethought my whole strategy as far as releasing it and marketing goes. Now I'm wondering, like I'm releasing the third single May 22nd. And now I'm thinking I might actually just put out the last two songs as singles and let them have their moment instead of lumping together the last two with like the three previous singles as an EP. There's a ton of great independent online radio stations that have been playing my music. So that's kind of the route I've been taking with that. Oh, smart. Yeah. Yeah. She Wolf Radio. There's there's a ton. Country Bells. And I've just been pushing that and they've been super supportive. Well, all right. So you named two places where people can hear your music on the independent radio stations. How can people buy your music? I'm pretty sure it's on any of the streaming platforms that you would use like Spotify, Google Play, Amazon, Apple. I think it's on everything. Deezer, Tidal. And I think this will be relevant when the, this lockdown is over. But I'm pretty sure you can actually find my song on those touch tunes, those digital jukeboxes that are in restaurants. Oh, yes. Yeah, I think my songs are now loaded into those. So that's kind of cool. Oh, that's sweet. Well, you know, that's a good reason to go out to a club or a pool hall or something. You can go in there and start playing your music. Yes, force everyone to listen to it. (laughs) (laughs) You'll be entertaining from a passive point of view. That's true. It'll be like, whoa, who is this? This is good. (laughs) Well, I know that we're getting toward the end of our conversation. And I did want to ask, obviously, the whole COVID pandemic thing has really put a damper on musicians as far as, you know, reaching their audiences, having an income, um, performing in general. What is your plan for the rest of 2020? So it looks like I won't be playing any big shows, which sucks. I'm just hoping to go back to gigging locally. Like my income is nothing. It's like down to nothing at this point. And when this first happened, I was like really scared. I'm like, how am I going to pay my bills? Because even when everything opens back up, can these restaurants afford to pay me now? Like they've lost so much money. I know. Everyone's suffering. Yes. And it's, it's like even the restaurants, when can we even go back out to eat and sit in a restaurant? Like, even if everything opens, when is that going to happen? So am I scared? Yeah. But I'm also optimistic because I feel like once I can gig again, everyone will be super excited about going out to see live music. So I'm just looking forward to that, to that day when that moment happens. But as far as plans go, like I said, I'm, I'm putting this song out May 22nd that I've been sitting on and I, I was kind of waiting to see you know, what happened with the world and it doesn't look like this is going to disappear anytime soon. So I was like, you know, it's been since the end of October since I put a song out. I'm just going to put a song out. And are you able to tell us the name of the song? I don't want to say anything yet. We're working on premieres for it right now. Ooh, okay. We will be watching very anxiously. I'm super stoked, but I can say that with confidence that it is nothing like the first two songs that I put out. Nothing. Even better. Well, we go back to that eclectic, you know, Kendall Conrad that I found and researched and enjoyed her music and her story. And, you know, Kendall, I would like to thank you so much for being on Backstage Chats with Women in Music. This was just delightful chatting with you today. Yeah, it was really fun. I feel like I really actually know you from this short time. It was a good chat. I feel like I know you too after spending days and days listening to music and watching videos and hearing your interviews. I just find you to be, like I said, very great at creating opportunity for yourself. One last thing before we leave, what would be some advice for you that you would give to a young woman who wants to start out in the music industry and create her own opportunity? Number one, it's not easy. Number two, no one is going to help you out of the goodness of their heart. So just be prepared for that. You have to really earn respect. And like you said, making my own opportunity, it's so fulfilling for me. Wonderful words of advice. Thank you so much. And you know what? Thanks to all of you listeners out there for joining uh, Kendall Conrad and myself. We love sharing the stories of women like Kendall because they remind us to be dreamers, to be rule breakers, 
and to unleash our inner rock star. I'm Thea Wood. Looking forward to seeing you at our next chat. Rock on, everybody. Audio engineering for this episode was provided by Podcast Engineers. Hit the subscribe button and never miss an episode of Backstage Chats with Women in Music. This podcast is a production of the Backstage Chats Foundation, a nonprofit that is on a mission to eliminate gender disparity in the music industry by amplifying the voices and careers of women in music. You can make a difference by donating to the cause. Visit backstagechats.com and click the donate button today.